Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Vantage Seminar and the first talk of the fall 2022 series. And Drew Sutherland and I are, are very happy to be having this series of talks on developments on isogeny based crypto systems. And today for our first talk, we're very happy to have Kristen Lauder, who, as many of you know, has played an esteemed role in the development of this subject. And she will be talking about super singular isogeny graphs in cryptography. Um, please save your questions for the end of the talk, or you could put them in the chat window if you'd prefer. And Kristen, is it all right for us to video this talk? Yes, thank you. Okay, please go ahead. Great. Well, thank you so much. Thanks, everyone, for joining. So I'm Kristen Lauder. I'm currently a director of West Coast Labs for Facebook AI Research, which is now called Meta AI. I um, am very happy to be speaking here. Thanks to Drew and Rachel for organizing this and for um, inviting me. Uh, I'm going to, oops, hopefully advance my slides. There we go. So I'm going to actually give um, a talk, my, my standard talk on this topic, which is an old talk. I have actually been giving roughly this talk since 2005, literally. So um, sorry about that. But on the other hand, one good thing is that I um, have added a lot of updated material here. Um, I gave a series of lectures just a couple of months ago in July at the um, Park City Math Institute um, and worked together with uh, Yana Sotokova, uh, my TA, um, to develop uh, the content. And she developed a great set of um, problems for uh, problem sessions. So there's actually material online that goes along with these lectures um, that are problem sets that Yana developed. Um, so you can see here kind of the outline there, but I'm just going to do the first talk, obviously, not, not all three. And um, I, even though it's an old talk, I want to give you a little bit of an update that there's been um, in the last roughly five years, basically from 2017 to, to now, and an ongoing series of works um, in, in uh, different uh, collaboration groups that I've led at the mostly at the WIN conferences that have uh, continued to kind of keep me involved in this in this subject. So I have to admit that these days my focus is on AI research on all areas, which includes you know computer vision and natural language processing and robotics and core machine learning. And so I'm currently working on um, actually AI for crypto, using AI to attack crypto systems. And so my focus has been much more um, in that direction since I went to uh, Facebook about a year and a half ago. And even before that, I was working very intently for a long time on what I call private AI and homomorphic encryption, which is based on lattice-based cryptography. So it's, a, a again, a very, very different topic um, from isogenies and isogeny graphs. Um, so I just wanted to explain why I'm giving, I'm kind of giving an older talk. I don't have time to prepare a new talk on this, but also what I find is, is that for people that are not all that familiar with the area, um, it's nice to kind of start at the beginning and, um, kind of give an overview of the history at the end. If we have time, I will say a little bit about, um, the high level content of several of these, uh, papers. So um, let me get started. So super singular isogeny graphs in cryptography. First, let's just start high level what, uh, about cryptography. So cryptography is the science of keeping secrets, but it's much more than that. Um, it is uh, not only about uh, protecting confidentiality, which is done through encryption, but also um, protecting authenticity, which is done through um, signatures and uh, digital signatures and signature schemes. And um, all of these different um, building blocks are, uh, uh, and also key exchanges for secure communication, all of these different uh, building blocks are based on 
hard problems in mathematics. So the ones um, that you've probably heard of, RSA is based on the hardness of factoring and um, Diffie-Hellman and elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman are based on the difficulty of the discrete logarithm problem in various groups. And um, there's even great um, protocols and really cool systems based on the hardness of inverting the Vey pairing on elliptic curves. Um, those are not quite as widely deployed as um, the others on this list. And all this whole um, collection of problems is deployed in the real world through the process of developing protocols, which are they kind of satisfy certain security properties according to security models that have been developed by computer scientists. And then the standardization process kind of brings these protocols to the real world. Um, the standardization process involves people from industry, professional societies, government, and academics working together to specify how these math building blocks can be used to um, fit together into protocols that are actually secure. And then these protocols are standardized and that allows for interoperability. So multiple people and companies and developers can, can work towards implementing a given standard. So I, I always like to mention this um, uh, issue of standardization and these kind of standards. I personally worked on standardization quite a bit in my career um, between 2000 and 2005 at Microsoft on elliptic curve cryptography. And over the last five years on uh, lattice-based cryptography and um, homomorphic encryption standardization. Uh, so it's something that I've certainly um, been heavily involved in and I find very interesting, but it's also kind of important to know is how do these, you know, hard math problems actually come to life? How do they come to the real world? Um, so I always like to mention that um, in my talks. Okay, so the other words in my title, super singular isogeny graphs, um, are going to take a little bit more time to explain. So I'm going to start with um, a little bit of more background uh, about elliptic curves. And again, I apologize because all of this is is kind of a crash course. You can give a whole you know semester long course on the cryptography that I just mentioned. I actually developed and taught a whole quarter course on elliptic curve cryptography at UCSD a long time ago. Um, so I can't you know cover a whole course in in one slide, but just to give you a placeholder and um, things to go back and look at. So um, elliptic curves in cryptography, we typically think of, there's a number of choices, but the main um, implementation that I worked on um, at Microsoft focused on elliptic curves over a large prime field. So P, consider P to be a prime of cryptographic size. And so I'll talk a little bit more later about what we mean by cryptographic size. And, and for cryptographers, they often think of an elliptic curve very simply as just being given by a short Weierstrass equation, because if P is extremely large, like cryptographic size, then in particular, it's not equal to either two or three. So we can just work with the short Weierstrass equation, which is of the form Y squared equals X cubed plus AX plus B. And um, an important fact that we'll use later on in the talk is that um, isomorphism classes of elliptic curves can be labeled with their J invariants. So if you look at um, isomorphisms over um, the algebraic closure of the front prime field FP, which I have this outstanding PowerPoint notation here, FP bar, I'm sorry about that. Um, that's one of the downsides of not using LaTeX to prepare my slides. Um, so the J invariant is just a rational function in the coefficients of the curve, define, the equation defining the curve. And also I should say this equation that I'm giving is just in the affine uh, model for the curve. So it doesn't, you don't see the points at the point at infinity in this case. So um, you, in order to see the point at infinity, you need to use, look at the projective version of the equation. Um, and that is important because there is the important thing about these curves is they have a group law and this algebraic group law we can think of as being defined geometrically through this chord and tangent method, which I'm not going to go into, but in particular, the point at infinity is the identity for this uh, group law. 
Um, so finally getting to one of the other words in my title. So super singular elliptic curves are those mod P, are those elliptic curves that have no P torsion points over FP bar, the algebraic closure of FP. Um, another equivalent way of saying what an, uh, a super singular elliptic curve is to say that it's endomorphism ring, which are the you know, morphisms that go from the curve to itself. Uh, the, its endomorphism ring is actually a rank four uh, Z module. So um, elliptic curves have endomorphisms, maps from the, you know, the curve to itself, because first of all, because of this group law, because it has a group that law, that means you can take any integer and you can multiply it times a point. So that means that the integers themselves are give you endomorphisms. But because it's over FP, you also have a Frobenius endomorphism. So for all elliptic curves over FP, you'll have um, you will have at least a rank two endomorphism uh, ring. And super singular curves are those that have actually rank four, and it's a uh, endomorphism ring which is non-commutative. So we will come back to that later. Um, in the talk, um, I'm, I'm actually saved most of the information about the quaternion algebras and these endomorphism rings for my third lecture at PCMI. So we won't cover too much about that today. Um, so, but one more important fact is, is that um, each isomorphism class of super singular elliptic curves um, over FP bar has a representative that is defined either over FP or FP squared. So that means that if you take the J, J invariant and compute it from that representative, you'll have a J invariant that's either in FP or in FP squared. And that's also important for later. Okay, so another um, important uh, thing that I want to cover, and um, I apologize because I, I do have too much material here for, for one hour or for 55 minutes or whatever. Um, so I I'm just going to try to highlight some of like the really important points. And this is one of the really important points because I was trained in number theory at the University of Chicago, number theory and algebraic geometry. And um, it was only during my postdoc at University of Michigan that I actually developed a course on error correcting codes and cryptography. And that's how I actually got into cryptography. And um, I was recruited to Microsoft Research in 1999. So dating myself from the last century, I actually went to Microsoft in 1999 and started really working in cryptography. And when I made that shift, one of the main things that I had to adjust to my mental model was um, the difference between working on number theoretic problems um, and working on number theoretic problems in the context of cryptography. So typically in math, what we think of as a hard problem, we just think it means like, oh, well, nobody's proved this theorem yet, you know, that that is some conjecture or something like that. Or maybe we need to construct something that's conjectured to, to exist, like Ramanujan graphs of, you know, of any degree or things like that. But in, in cryptography, what we mean by a hard problem is that given the input, the best known algorithms to attack the problem, to solve the problem, run in exponential time in the number of bits of your input. And so this causes a lot of confusion between the math and computer science community because of um, the way people um, talk about uh, the size of a problem. But for us, so if you have, for example, an RSA modulus, um, which I'm calling little n here at the bottom of my slide, then what you need to do is you need to look at the number of bits that it takes you to represent that number. So let's say it's M bits. So that means the number is roughly the size two to the M. And so the best known algorithms for attacking um, a system, if they run in a power, like a, an exponential function in M, like O of two to the M, then we call that an exponential time algorithm. But if it's polynomial in that number of input bits, then we call that a polynomial time algorithm. And then there are things in between like sub-exponential time algorithms, um, which as you can see are exponential, but in a fractional power of M, the number of bits where that fraction is between zero and one. 
So like a one third algorithm would a one half or a one third L one third L one half algorithm would be like if the exponent here is one third. So um, throughout the talk, if I mention polynomial time, sub exponential and exponential time algorithms, this this is what I mean. So <clears throat> that's a good context for um, talking now about some motivation for the main topic of my talk, super singular isogeny graphs. And that is um, what we call the quantum threat. So industry and academia and governments have been investing a lot of money over the last 10 or more years in scaling up uh, quantum computers. So we already have quantum computers that um, are a very small size that can handle very, very, very small amounts of computation. But once we have a quantum computer at scale that can, can handle like thousands of logical qubits and compute things um, without losing too much like fidelity of computation, um, we will be able to attack all of the efficiently attack all of the currently deployed um, public key crypto systems that we use worldwide to protect our um, infrastructure for secu secure communication and storage and all kinds of authentic authenticity and all kinds of important tasks. Um, so that is based on, so starting in the, in the 90s, Shor's algorithm around uh, 95, I think, um, Sh Shor showed a polynomial time quantum algorithm for factoring, which runs in roughly 4M cubed time. So you can see it's polynomial in M, where M is the number of bits, and you it requires a um, a com, uh, quantum computer of of size that can handle two M uh, qubits. And for elliptic curve cryptography, because our parameter sizes are smaller, um, the running time is um, still roughly uh, cubic, uh, so three hundred and sixty M cubed running time, but requires. Uh, roughly 6M qubits, um, according to estimates by Proust and Zalka, which um, we made a little more precise in a um, 2019 Eurocrypt paper with the, um, with the quantum uh, algorithms group at Microsoft Research. So the conclusion from that is, if you look at current minimum um, standards for deploying RSA, uh, so 2048-bit RSA is kind of a min minimum U.S. government standard. Um, so that would mean you would need a quantum computer that can handle at least like roughly 4,000 qubits. Whereas for elliptic curve cryptography, if you stick with the current, well, the previous minimum was two, 256. And so six times that would be more like 1,500 qubits you would need. So in 2017, um, uh, NIST actually uh, uh, released, or sorry, NSA released new, um, 2016, they released the CNSA requirements, which increased the bit length of ECC from 256 to 384. And in 2017, NIST launched a five-year um, uh, post-quantum crypto competition to um, incentivize the development of um, systems and the study of uh, crypto systems that could potentially be resistant to quantum computers um, once quantum computers are developed at scale. So one thing I like to emphasize is that this is a very uh, risky business. Um, just in July th this year, 2022, um, NIST actually released um, its recommendations for standardizing the first um, three systems, I think, two of which were based on lattice-based uh, lattice cryptography, lattice problems. Um, and, um, but for all of these uh, post-quantum proposals, uh, we really need to see now, not only if they are resistant to quantum algorithms, but also even if they're resistant to classical algorithms. Um, so I think that... Um, it's a very good motivation for mathematicians to actually work in these fields because as these systems get um, standardized and then uh, deployed, um, they'll affect the security of all of our um, kind of e-commerce systems for, for many years to come. So I wanted to talk just very briefly about at a high level, the main kind of math, hard math problems that were being considered in the last five years in the NIST PQC competition. 
So the oldest one um, is based on code-based cryptography initially proposed by McLeese in 1978. Um, so code-based cryptography is pretty cool. It's based on the hardness of um, decoding random linear codes. Uh, so um, you can think of random linear code as being just basically like a, a linear subspace where a certain amount of information um, that like basically K bits of information has been um, transformed into N bits of information by multiplying by a generator matrix. So you basically have just an, um, a dimension N uh, kind of linear, linear subspace. And um, you, uh, to decode uh, random linear codes, uh, you know, we don't have good algorithms for that um, today, but we have lots of like concrete constructions of linear codes, error correcting codes, including some coming from algebraic geometry, which is actually one of the things I worked on in, in my thesis, um, in my PhD. But um, so uh, we actually have good decoding algorithms for a lot of linear codes that we have specifically constructed. And so what you also have to do um, for the security of these error correcting um, crypto systems is you have to be able to disguise a linear code for which you know a decoding algorithm, you disguise it as a random one. So it's actually the hardness of two problems that it relies on. Um, so the second um, main area that's been uh, heavily considered over the last five years in the NIST um, PQC competition is multivariate crypto systems, which um, were first proposed by Matsumoto and Imai, Imai in 1988. So not quite as old as code base uh, systems. Um, and I'm not going to go into too much detail here on those um, uh, for the sake of time. Um, so the third uh, uh, area, which has uh, turned out to be quite successful since two of them have already been standardized, is uh, lattice-based cryptography, which was first proposed by Hofstein, Pfeiffer, and Silverman um, with the uh, N-True system in the mid-90s, around, around 96. Um, computer scientists often attribute lattice-based cryptography to um, uh, computer scientists. It just shows the separation between communities um, so since this is a math seminar, I always like to make sure to give uh, credit to the mathematicians uh, who um, introduced lattice-based cryptography. And so you can see in the mid-90s, that's already, um, you know, more than 25 years ago. Um, so those uh, systems have been around for a while. But the hard problems uh, that the lattice-based crypto is based on, like the shortest vector problem and related approximate shortest vector problem, et cetera, those problems have been around since the 80s. So one of the main, the main template for the exponential algorithms, Conan's algorithm for shortest vector problem actually dates from the mid 80s. So those problems have been around for a long time. So then finally, I come to the topic of this talk, which is super singular isogeny graphs in cryptography, which was uh, first proposed in cryptography um, in 2005 with my co-authors, Dennis Charles and Ayal Gorin. And we, uh, as I mentioned, we spoke about this at the NIST 2005 hash function competition. And um, you'll see in a minute why we were talking about hash functions there. Um, so, but just an update. Um, so in July, actually right after my PCMI lectures finished, uh, a new paper was posted on the internet from, um, uh, uh, Wouter Kastrick and Thomas de Cruz actually attacking the key exchange um, that uh, was submitted to, to the NIST competition based on um, super singular isogeny graphs. Um, that's the Zhao DeFeo um, PLU system, and that system has been attacked. So if I have time at the end, I'll talk a little bit more about that. But otherwise, I think you're going to hear more about those attacks probably later in this series of talks, because I know uh, Wouter Kastrick is um, giving a talk on that and actually uh, um, also organizing an, a workshop in, in, um, in Leuven right now, the, today and the next, the next two days on this topic. So pretty cool, lots of work going on in this area right now. Um, okay, so finally, what are super singular isogeny graphs and why are they relevant to cryptography? So the new hard problem that we introduced into, into cryptography in 2005 was the hardness of finding paths between nodes in these graphs. So imagine a gigantic 
cryptographic size um, uh, graph and um, just imagine two random uh, nodes in that graph or vertices. I use the words vertex and node interchangeably. So two random vertices, and then the problem, hard problem is finding a path between those two vertices. So the nice thing is this is a really easy problem to state. So you kind of know uh, what the problem is, but um, it's a lot more difficult to actually describe the graph. So first of all, you want to describe the graph abstractly in a way that doesn't require to, you to write down the whole graph because you don't have enough space to write down a graph that has like two to the 256 vertices. So um, just to, sorry, to go back and uh, remind you. So what, what I was saying about um, hard problems in cryptography and exponential running times is, is that um, you wanna have uh, problem sizes, which are large enough so that the best known running times are either exponential or they're large enough so that they cannot be accomplished in our lifetime or on a supercomputer or whatever. So a typical size, when I say cryptographic size, are the minimum sizes that I mentioned that are used for RSA and ECC today. So for RSA, cryptographic size means like the, the number has several thousand bits. And for ECC, it means that the, it's over a prime field, which has several hundred bits, like 256 bits or 384 bits. So imagine a gigantic prime P, which has, has let's just start with 256 bits. For key exchange, they actually had to take a larger P. Um, and then now we're going to define what is the graph? that we have over this uh, large prime field FP. So um, the vertices are going to be isomorphism classes of super singular elliptic curves mod P. So I talked about that a little bit in the beginning. What do we mean by that? And we have labels for those isomorphism classes and the, the label is the J invariant. So as I mentioned, the J invariant for each one of these isomorphism classes is actually gonna live in either FP or FP squared which is very nice because that tells you how much space it takes you to write it down. So if P has like 256 bits, it takes you either 256 bits or 512 bits to, to write down this J invariant. Um, so the next uh, thing that I need to describe is um, what are the edges of this graph? And those will be the isogeny. So I'll come, come back to that a little bit uh, in a little bit more detail later. Uh, so there are maps between these elliptic curves. So birational maps from the algebraic geometry point of view, um, but you can also think of them since these are elliptic curves are actually groups. They have a group structure, as I said. You can also just think of them as actually quotienting by a subgroup of the group of points. So th those are gonna be the edges. And the important thing about this graph for our proposal was that there's no known efficient routing algorithm. So there's no, um, a known um, sub-exponential solution to this problem that I mentioned, which is finding paths between these vertices. So how are we gonna use this hard problem? So what we proposed was to construct a, a cryptographic hash function. So first of all, what is a hash function? A hash function just maps bits of strings, of, uh, sorry, bit strings of some finite length to other bit strings of some other finite length. So like bit strings of length N to bit strings of length M. Sorry, the N and M here have nothing to do with N and M in other places of, uh, of the talk. Um, but a typical application would be like, um, like a message digest, like, or taking a large file and you wanna have <clears throat> some kind of um, basically like a compressed, um, uh, version of the file that you can sign so that you can check whether a file actually is um, the file that was sent by checking the signature. So N could typically be very, very large if it's like, think of it as being a movie um, that you're trying to take the hash of. Um, and then M would be small. So if um, like in the cryptographic protocols, M equals, you know, something like 128 or 256 um, is very typical for a, a, a hash function like um, SHA-256. Um, so hash functions need to be very easy to compute because obviously they need to be efficient. Um, hash functions are typically unkeyed. That means it does not require a secret key to compute the hash function. It's like a publicly known function that anyone can evaluate um, as opposed to max. Max are like kind of like hash functions, which are um, 
require a key. You need a secret key to compute them. And then um, the properties that make make it an actual cryptographic hash function, that requires a longer conversation. I think at one point in the hash function competition, um, there was a discussion of like seven different properties that should be considered um, that the entries should satisfy. But the properties, the essential ones that are non-negotiable that I'm gonna mention here are collision resistance and also this kind of uniformly distributed output. So collision resistance, what do we mean by that? We mean um, a hash function is collision resistant if it's computationally infeasible to find two inputs which, which hash to the same output. And we say like a slight refinement of this is, is that the hash function is pre-image resistant if given a particular output, it is infeasible to find an input which hashes to that output. So um, clearly if you can, um, find, uh, if you can solve the pre-image resistance problem, then you can definitely solve the collision uh, problem because you can just take a random number, hash it, now you have an output, now use your pre-image pre um, algorithm to find a different um, input which hashes to that same output. So the pre-image resistance problem is really kind of the holy grail here. It's the, the, the really hard problem that you want your systems to satisfy. And so um, what we did is to use um, the hard problem of finding paths in, in general in graphs. Uh, we'll get to the super singular isogeny graphs uh, specifics more in a minute. But if you have um, a very large graph in which this routing problem is hard, then you can define a hash function as follows. Um, so the first thing that we do based on the hardness of, of finding, finding that path, so the first thing that we're gonna assume is, is that our graphs are K regular, so, and also undirected. So from our point of view, when you're walking around the graph, the edges are not directed. You can walk on either direction on an edge. Um, and so uh, we want the graphs to be K regular, which means that there's K edges coming out of every node. Um, and also we need every node or vertex to be um, to have a label because we actually have to implement this hash function. So um, that's another important assumption that we have labels for our for our vertices. Um, so the input should be um, a bit a, a bit string. The input for a hash function is a, a long string. And what you're going to do is you're going to divide it up into chunks. And each of these chunks, these blocks, is going to be used as directions for walking around this graph, um, which just means determining which edge to follow out of each vertex. And a very key point is that no backtracking is allowed. So you go out an edge and you are not allowed to turn around and come back that same edge. Because if you did that, it would be easy to create collisions by just going along an edge and uh, going along a path and like going backwards and forwards at two different places. And then you would have two walks that end in the same place. So no backtracking is allowed. And then the output of the hash function is going to be the final vertex of the walk. So you take the input string, you use it as directions for walking around, you end your walk somewhere and you output the label of that vertex. And that's the output for your, for your hash function. So just as an example, it very simply, if you have a three regular graph and you're processing this bit string 110, um, because no backtracking is allowed uh, for a three regular graph, you only have two choices for every step other than the first step. And so you just use um, one bit at a time. So your chunks, your blocks are one bit um, blocks in this case. And so you read off the first bit is one. So you follow the edge, which is labeled one. And then the second bit is also a one. So you follow that uh, arrow. And then the third bit is a zero. So you follow that. So that's just like a very simple picture to explain how the hash function works. And also, so collisions, what you're trying to avoid um, in these hash functions is uh, the potential for collisions. So what you can kind of see here, if you um, don't pay attention to my arrows, my arrows were, were like directions for walking, but they're not, like I said, this is supposed to be an undirected graph. So if you don't pay attention to the arrows here being directed, then you can see that a collision really corresponds to a cycle in the graph. So actually one of the things that we did in our original 2006 paper was to, pro to propose um, 
uh, congruence conditions on the primes P to avoid the possibility of having small cycles. So avoiding basically double edges or cycles of um, uh, small, small lengths. Okay, so um, just to pause here um, to kind of think about what we've said so far. This is um, a pretty simple idea to take big expander graphs, and I haven't talked yet about what expander graph means. That was that's part of my second lecture, so I'll mostly leave that for the for the rest of the slides if anybody wants to peruse those later. But expander graphs um, are a really good source of pseudo randomness because. Um, short walks on expander graphs very quickly get you to a roughly uniformly distributed output. So that was the reason that we were proposing using expander graphs, because the output of our hash function, as long as we take a walk, which is roughly log of the number of vertices, will end up at a essentially uniformly distributed point. So you won't see a lot of bias in the output of your hash function, which is what we were after. But in addition, for this collision resistance and pre-image resistance, we need a graph where finding, uh, um, finding paths is, is hard. So I always like to give a kind of a counterexample, an idea of a graph that has good expansion, but which is a very bad idea for this proposal. And that's the hypercube. So if you just think of a graph where every vertex is labeled with a, a sequence of bits, um, zeros and ones, and so like the n-dimensional hyper, hypercube, it's very easy to uh, find many paths between any two vertices because two vertices will just be two um, labels, two, two sequences, bit strings of length n. And in order to get from one to the other, you just need to flip every bit where they differ and you can flip them in any order. So you can find many, many paths between any two vertices. And so I once uh, heard a beautiful talk by Ron Graham a long time ago at UCSD um, that the property of, of um, being hard, like the hard routing property in graphs, you think you can think of as being equivalent to being kind of isometric to um, a, a uh, kind of like a subgraph of, of the hypercube. So I know that's not a very precise statement and it was probably almost 20 years ago that I, I heard this talk by him, but um, that always stuck with me as a nice way to think of the hardness of routing in these in these graphs. Okay, so um, when uh, we talk about um, expander graphs, one of the things of interest to number theorists is what we call optimal expander graphs, which are Ramanujan graphs. I'm not going to get into it, but um, there's a precise definition of what we mean by optimal here. And, um, but the nice thing is, is that the graphs that we proposed in our um, 2006 paper with um, Charles and Gorin was, um, we proposed to use the, the Pizer master graphs. So we called them Pizer graphs. Some people call them master graphs. Um, and these are now today, we call them super singular isogeny graphs in the cryptographic context. So these are the graphs that I mentioned earlier. Um, I'll go over again just to remind you what they are. But um, we also had another proposal in that paper, which was what we call LPS graphs, which was um, the first construction of Ramanujan graphs by Lubatsky, Philip Sarnak. And those are actually Cayley graphs in SL2FP. And those are very nice graphs because they're super easy to implement. Um, they're Cayley graphs where the group is just this, you know, um, non-abelian group. And so um, we, we proposed this in 2006 and already in Eurocrypt 2008, that proposal was broken. Um, so it, uh, the um, collisions were found in the paper by um, Zemmer and Tillich in uh, Eurocrypt 2018. And very quickly following on that, um, Christophe Petit and I uh, published uh, with his advisor, Jean-Jacques uh, Kiscate, a paper finding pre-images for those graphs. And so um, the neat thing there, this is just a little side uh, note, is, is that the algorithm that we found for finding paths in LPS graphs, uh, Lubuski was very happy about because he said that problem had been open for several decades ever since they proposed those graphs, um, how to find paths in the graph. 
And I think um, it's, for me, one of my favorite examples of what you can get by working on applications in mathematics. So we were, we were motivated to work on that problem because of the applications in, that we had proposed in cryptography. And so you had other members of the community coming up with the collision resistance, and we very quickly were able to modify that to get pre -image, um, the pre-image algorithm. And um, so this was a contribution to mathematics that came from working on the applications. And then later in another beautiful twist, um, Ross uh, and Selinger came up with an algorithm um, for doing efficient quantum arithmetic, which is actually essentially, Sarnak realized that it's essentially the same algorithm as what we had proposed in 2008, 2009, um, for finding paths in these LPS graphs. So it's also a very nice connection between um, cryptographic, um, you know, expander graph uh, problems and quantum arithmetic, so which is a topic for, for the future. So anyway, that was my little sidebar. So coming back to SIG, the super singular isogeny graphs, like I said in the beginning, the vertices in these graphs are isomorphism classes of elliptic curves mod P. So their J invariants are in FP or FP squared, and those are the labels. And um, the edges are isogenies between the graphs. Um, these are actually L plus, if L is prime, we're gonna consider degree L isogenies. So for most applications, L is of either equal to two or three. So very important to notice that P is large of cryptographic size and L is small, L is like two or three. So in particular, L is co-prime to P, which makes all of these isogenies separable. So they're completely characterized by their kernel. So in order to specify an isogeny, all you have to do is specify its kernel, which is gonna be some subgroup of the group of points of, on the elliptic curve over FP or FP squared. And what you're really doing when you take this isogeny is you're quotienting, quotienting by that subgroup. And um, the, uh, the formulas for that, I'll show you in just a second for performing these, um, for computing these isogenies efficiently for elliptic curves was developed by uh, Velu in the 70s, actually. So two more important facts about these SIG graphs, the Pizer Messenger graphs, is Pizer was the one that proved already in, um, I believe it was the early 90s, that um, these graphs are Ramanujan if we assume that P is congruent to one mod 12. Um, you can get that they're, um, sorry, they're, they're undirected if we assume that P is congruent to one mod 12, but um, we can get that they're Ramanujan through a lot of beautiful and deep mathematics um, relying on, for example, like um, Deline's work and um, a lot of other deep number theory that uh, we're not gonna talk about here. So these are very beautiful graphs um, from, from that perspective. And, um, so here's just like a, a quick summary of how you would actually use these things in practice. So if you had an elliptic curve, let's say E1 um, with this J invariant, you, um, <clears throat> for, and you wanna take a walk on the two isogeny graph, you would take E1 and you would quotient it by a, uh, a subgroup of order two, which is just generated by a two torsion point Q, um, which is of the form R comma zero with this short Weierstrass form, the two torsion points are very easy. They just have um, Y coordinate equal to zero. And quotienting by that subgroup, you'll get this a curve E2, which you can see this very explicit equation for where the new coefficients are just um, a rational, well, are actually polynomials in the coefficients of the original uh, curve and the, the coordinate of the two torsion point. Um, so you also get a very explicit formula for the isogeny too. So the isogeny maps points to points. So this is a representation of what the isogeny looks like um, on points. So how it maps X, Y to the target point on the new curve. Okay, so I haven't um, come to my uh, five minute warning yet. So um, for the remainder of the talk, um, I'd like to talk a little bit about um, uh, the what has happened kind of since we proposed these um, super singular isogeny graphs in, in cryptography. 
So um, I gave a lot of talks, basically this talk that you've just seen minus a lot of the extra commentary um, between 2005 and 2008. And I gave a talk on this actually at the joint math meetings and Dana McKenzie, who's a science writer uh, was in the audience and he wrote a, um, an article on the uh, proposal for Science Magazine. So um, it appeared in 2008 called Hash of the Future. It was one of the proposals that was considered in the hash function um, work competition workshops, but not actually submitted as one of the entries um, because we thought it was too inefficient. And indeed the hash functions that were standardized were um, not based on public key crypto. And so they, this was not really in the running from the point of view of efficiency. But um, the, uh, the, gra the graph, the picture that we show here, I'm not sure, is, is my picture of the people blocking the actual picture of the graph? No, no, we, we can see it, looks good. Okay, good, so thanks. So we actually, um, uh, uh, Dennis Charles and Yal Gorn and I actually developed this picture um, and gave it to them um, to use in Science Magazine. Um, so this is a picture of the um, super singular isogeny graph. Um, uh oh, let's see if I can ignore that. Um, when the prime p is roughly, um, I think it's like twenty five, twenty one. So it's just, I mean, two thousand five hundred and twenty one is roughly like eleven bits more or less between 11 and 12 bits. So it's a very, very small prime. And one thing that I'm not sure if I mentioned, but the size of these graphs, like the number of isomorphism classes of super singular um, elliptic curves is related to P by the Eichler class number formula. So it's roughly P over 12. So if P is like 25, 21, then if you divide that by 12, you're looking at, at about 200 vertices. So here's a tiny little graph with 200 vertices. And the point in showing this is that you can see the extent to which this graph is not, um, doesn't have a clear direction or orientation. Like um, it just looks like a jumbled mass. And so if you start at one point, like we're illustrating the hardness of pathfinding here, by taking two points like the vertex number one and this vertex over here at the end of the blue path is, I can't quite read it, 24 or 34. And so you're just given these two vertices and you ask, how do, you, how do I get from this one to that one? So you just, you have to find a path. And in this case, we've shown you this blue path, but you can see that there's nothing natural about it or no obvious direction that you can take. And the same thing is true for um, the cycle. So finding cycles, here's a cycle in the graph that could potentially be used to produce a collision. And that is a, um, in, in, in red here. So maybe like if there's one thing um, to remember from this talk, other than what do we mean by a hard problem in crypt cryptographic uh, number theory, it's um, this picture of a super singular isogeny graph. And now imagine that the prime P is instead of being like 11 or 12 bits, it's um, like uh, 256 bits or even, even bigger. So, you know, 512 or 756 bits. So the point being is when P is of cryptographic size, you can't write down the whole graph. So you cannot see the graph but you can still do all the steps that you need to implement the hash function. So you can write down J invariants of elliptic curves, taking only a small number of bits, like 256 bits. You can compute isogenies efficiently, like two isogenies. I showed you how efficient those are. So you can walk around this graph. You can compute the J invariant of the elliptic curve that you land on. So you can output the output of the hash function. So all of the operations are relatively efficient. They're on the order of the same cost that of the public key operations, like for example, for um, classical elliptic curve crypto systems. Um, so just a little bit about- um, the This is your five minute warning you asked for. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you so much. So just to kind of give the context um, of what's, what's happened since then, since the uh, mid 2000s, 
Um, so after our preprint appeared in 2006, um, two other preprints appeared on ePrint. Neither of them was actually ever published, uh, one by Kuvenya uh, called Hard Hom Homogeneous Spaces and one by um, uh, Rosa uh, Stoblunov, which is um, the ordinary case for encryption. The ordinary case is very different from um, the super singular uh, case for many reasons, but there are connections which have been investigated since then. I believe that um, Stephen Galbraith in his talk later today is going to talk more about the ordinary case, so I'm not going to talk more about that now. Um, so, um, the other graphs that we um, considered that could be used for this, for cryptography and for this hash function, for example, or for other crypto protocols you might want to develop. Um, I mentioned the LPS graphs and the history of those um, getting uh, broken. So collisions found in Eurocrypt 2000. Oh, sorry, I might've said 2018, I meant 2008. Um, and then our paper on pre-image uh, finding for LPS graphs. Um, Another uh, notable uh, gra graph construction that I want to mention is um, the higher genus, the genus two um, or higher dimensional analogs of the super singular isogeny graph. The funny thing is, is, is that when we came up with this proposal um, with Charles and Gorin, uh, we were actually not working on super singular isogeny graphs with, uh, with elliptic curves. We were working on the higher dimensional analog. So we were trying to define Ramanuj actually sequences of towers of Ramanujan graphs using um, super special abelian varieties in higher dimensions, in particular uh, dimension two. So we had uh, you know, included uh, proofs of the Ramanujan property of those graphs, which are relevant to the genus two algorithms that are being considered um, today. And so another really fun graph that I wanted to mention is um, the uh, adding level structure to the super singular isogeny graph. So um, in her thesis this year, Sarah Arpin um, has investigated these graphs with adding level structure. So please talk to Sarah or, or look at her thesis for more information about that. Um, so, and as you could probably imagine from this um, rich set of graphs and, and problems, there's a lot of work that's been go going on in this area ever since um, 2005, uh, in particular um, with the advent of the key exchange proposals proposed in 2009 and published in 2011 by Zhao, DeFeo, and Plu. Um, the, the, uh, the key exchange has been a, a target for lots of um, potential attacks um, including attacks trying to use the torsion points that are known in those um, protocols, which are not known when you're just using the hash function, um, using the graph for hash function. Um, so those torsion points are very key in the attack by um, Kastrick and DeCru. Um, lots of people working on um, like a, a seaside um, alternatives um, in the kind of ordinary uh, situation. Lots of people working on the dimension two analogs, um, signatures, and then also on the graph structure. So I'd like to just take like the last just couple minutes and just um, give a high level plug for some of the work um, going on in the, um, the last five years that I've been involved with. So um, the first paper that I'd like to just kind of give a high level plug for is the Adventures in Super Singular Land paper, which is published um, uh, in the uh, experimental um, Journal of Experimental Mathematics um, in honor of Alice Silverberg, because it started in a collaboration group at um, the conference we organized, um, uh, the Silverberg Conference in honor of Alice's uh, birthday. This paper focuses on um, an interesting uh, observation that we made that we had not seen in the literature anywhere before that, which is, is that, these graphs actually have a symmetry. They have more structure than what we think because you have an involution, which uh, like the FP squared um, you know, involution that fixes FP. Um, so it fixes the FP points in the graph and maps any kind of J invariant in FP squared to its conjugate, its, its FP conjugate. So we actually have, you can kind of think of it as a mirror, although it's really hard to see it when you write down uh, an example of the graph. 
uh, where we have a reflection and we have paths that go um, between uh, a J invariant in FP squared and its conjugate, um, which uh, kind of are what we call mirror paths. In other words, if you apply this, this mirror, the first half of the path would map onto the second half of the path. So in this paper, we investigate this symmetry and, the di and we call this the spine, the fixed points of this evolution. And we investigate the distance of random points to the spine because um, we know better algorithms for finding um, pathfinding in the um, in the spine, really, in what the case that comes from the kind of the ordinary case, and so um, there's a lot of cool experimental results in this graph as well as um, uh, as well as investigating a little bit um, more on the expansion constant of these of these graphs, and then uh, more recently in our Win Five paper, um, so this was a project co-leading with with Kate Stang and um, and really Renata Scheidler has been one of the, the uh, key leaders. Uh, the group there has really in, in investigated how you can use just one endomorphism to come up with a kind of pathfinding algorithm. So it's called orienteering or pathfinding with one endomorphism. So that's a little plug for that, um, for that paper too. Okay, so I think um, at this point I'm out of time and I just wanna thank you all for listening and I'd uh, be happy to take questions. Wonderful, thank you so much, Kristen.